This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer to read a chapter yourself, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster. www.alexfoster.me.uk A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 23 Water Discovered for a whole hour I was trying to work out in my delirious brain the reasons which might have influenced this seemingly tranquil huntsman. The absurdest notions ran in utter confusion through my mind. I thought madness was coming on. But at last a noise of footsteps was heard in the dark abyss. Hans was approaching. A flickering light was beginning to glimmer on the wall of our darksome prison. Then it came out full at the mouth of the gallery. Hans appeared. He drew close to my uncle laid his hand upon his shoulder, and gently woke him. My uncle rose up. "'What is the matter?' he asked. "'Vatten!' replied the huntsman. No doubt, under the inspiration of intense pain, everybody becomes endowed with the gift of diverse tongues. I did not know a word of Danish, yet instinctively I understood the word he uttered. "'Water! Water!' I cried, clapping my hands and gesticulating like a madman. "'Water!' repeated my uncle. "'Havar?' he asked in Icelandic. "'Nidat!' replied Hans. "'Where? Down below!' I understood it all. I seized the hunter's hands and pressed them while he looked on me without moving a muscle of his countenance. The preparations for our departure were not long in making, and we were soon on our way down a passage inclining two feet in seven. In an hour we had gone a mile and a quarter, and descended two thousand feet then I began to hear distinctly quite a new sound of something running within the thickness of the granite wall, a kind of dull, dead rambling, like distant thunder. During the first part of our walk, not meeting with the promised spring, I felt my agony returning, but then my uncle acquainted me with the cause of the strange noise. Hans was not mistaken, he said. What you hear is the rushing of a torrent. A torrent? I exclaimed. There can be no doubt. A subterranean river is flowing around us. We hurried forward in the greatest excitement. I was no longer sensible of my fatigue. This murmuring of waters close at hand was already refreshing me. It was audibly increasing. The torrent, after having for some time flowed over our heads, was now running within the left wall, roaring and rushing. Frequently I touched the wall, hoping to feel some indications of moisture, but there was no hope here. Yet another half-hour, another half-league was passed. Then it became clear that the hunter had gone no farther. Guided by an instinct peculiar to mountaineers, he had as it were felt this torrent through the rock, but he had certainly seen none of the precious liquid. He had drunk nothing himself. Soon it became evident that if we continued our walk we should widen the distance between ourselves and the stream, the noise of which was becoming fainter. We returned. Hans stopped where the torrent seemed closest. I sat near the wall, while the waters were flowing past me at a distance of two feet with extreme violence, but there was a thick granite wall between us and the object of our desires. Without reflection, without asking if there were any means of procuring the water, I gave way to a moment of despair. Hans glanced at me with, I thought, a smile of compassion. He rose and took the lamp. I followed him. He moved towards the wall. I looked on. He applied his ear against the dry stone, and moved it slowly to and fro, listening intently. I perceived at once that he was examining to find the exact place where the torrent could be heard the loudest. He met with that point on the left side of the tunnel, at three feet from the ground. I stood up with excitement. I hardly dared guess what the hunter was about to do. But I could not but understand, and applaud and cheer him on when I saw him take hold of the pickaxe to make an attack upon the rock. "'We are saved!' I cried. "'Yes!' cried my uncle, almost frantic with excitement. "'Hans is right. Capital fellow! Who but he would have thought of it?' "'Yes, who but he! Such an expedient, however simple, would never have entered our minds. True, it seemed most hazardous to strike a blow of the hammer in this part of the earth's structure.' Suppose some displacement should occur and crush us all. Suppose the torrent bursting through should drown us in a sudden flood. 
there was nothing vain in these fancies. But still no fears of falling rocks or rushing floods could stay us now, and our thirst was so intense that, to satisfy it, we would have dared the waves of the North Atlantic. Hans set about the task which my uncle and I together could not have accomplished. If our impatience had armed our hands with power, we should have shattered the rock into a thousand fragments. Not so Hans. Full of self-possession, he calmly wore his way through the rock with a steady succession of light and skilful strokes, working through an aperture six inches wide at the outside. I could hear a louder noise of flowing waters, and I fancied I could feel the delicious fluid refreshing my parched lips. The pick had soon penetrated two feet into the granite partition, and our man had worked for above an hour. I was in an agony of impatience. My uncle wanted to employ stronger measures, and I had some difficulty in dissuading him. Still he had just taken a pickaxe in his hand, when a sudden hissing was heard, and a jet of water spurted out with violence against the opposite wall. Hans, almost thrown off his feet by the violence of the shock, uttered a cry of grief and disappointment, of which I soon understood the cause, when, plunging my hands into the spouting torrent, I withdrew them in haste, for the water was scalding hot. "'The water is at the boiling point!' I cried. "'Well, never mind. Let it cool,' my uncle replied. The tunnel was filling with steam, whilst a stream was forming, which by degrees wandered away into the subterranean windings, and soon we had the satisfaction of swallowing our first draught. Could anything be more delicious than the sensation that our burning intolerable thirst was passing away, and leaving us to enjoy comfort and pleasure? But where was this water from? No matter. It was water, and though still warm, it brought life back to the dying. I kept drinking without stopping and almost without tasting. At last, after a most delightful time of reviving energy, I cried, "'Why, this is a Calibiat spring!' "'Nothing could be better for the digestion,' said my uncle. "'It is highly impregnated with iron. "'It will be as good for us as going to the spa or to Toplitz.' "'Well, it is delicious.' "'Of course it is. "'Water should be found six miles underground. "'It has an inky flavour which is not at all unpleasant. "'What a capital source of strength Hans has found for us here. "'We will call it after his name.' "'Agreed,' I cried. "'And Hansbach it was from that moment. "'Hans was none the prouder. "'After a moderate draught he went quietly into a corner to rest. "'Now,' I said, "'we must not lose this water.' "'What is the use of troubling ourselves?' my uncle replied. "'I fancy it will never fail.' "'Never mind. We cannot be sure. "'Let us fill the water-bottle and our flasks, and then stop up the opening.' "'My advice was followed so far as getting in a supply, "'but the stopping up of the hole was not so easy to accomplish. "'It was in vain that we took up fragments of granite and stuffed them in. "'We only scalded our hands without succeeding. "'The pressure was too great, and our efforts were fruitless.' "'It is quite plain,' said I, "'that the higher body of this water is at a considerable elevation. "'The force of the jet shows that.' "'No doubt,' answered my uncle. "'If this column of water is thirty-two thousand feet high, "'that is, from the surface of the earth, "'it is equal to the weight of a thousand atmospheres. "'But I have got an idea. "'Well, why should we trouble ourselves "'to stop the stream from coming out at all? "'Because, well, I could not assign a reason.' When our flasks are empty, where shall we fill them again? Can we tell that? No, there was no certainty. Well, let us allow the water to run on. It will flow down, and will both guide and refresh us. That's well planned, I cried. With this stream for our guide, there is no reason why we should not succeed in our undertaking. Ha! my boy, you agree with me now, cried the professor, laughing. I agree with you most heartily. Well, let us rest a while, and then we will start again. I was forgetting that it was night. The chronometer soon informed me of the fact, and in a very short time, refreshed and thankful, we all three fell into a sound sleep. End of chapter 23 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster www.alexfoster.me.uk A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 23
Chapter Twenty Four. Well said, old mole. Counts thy work in the ground so fast. By the next day, we had forgotten all our sufferings. At first, I was wondering that I was no longer thirsty, and I was for asking for the reason. The answer came in the murmuring of the stream at my feet. We breakfasted and drank of this excellent Calibiate water. I felt wonderfully stronger, and quite decided upon pushing on. Why should not so firmly convinced a man as my uncle, furnished with so industrious a guide as Hans, and accompanied by so determined a nephew as myself, go on to final success? Such were the magnificent plans which struggled for mastery within me. If it had been proposed to me to return to the summit of Snaefell, I should have indignantly declined. Most fortunately, all we had to do was descend. "'Let us start!' I cried, awakening by my shouts the echoes of the vaulted hollows of the earth. On Thursday, at eight a.m., we started afresh. The granite tunnel, winding from side to side, earned us past unexpected turns, and seemed almost to form a labyrinth. But, on the whole, its direction seemed to be south-easterly. My uncle never ceased to consult his compass to keep account of the ground gone over. The gallery dipped down a little way from the horizontal, scarcely more than two inches in a fathom, and the stream ran gently murmuring at our feet. I compared it to a friendly genius guiding us underground, and caressed with my hand the soft naiad, whose comforting voice accompanied our steps. With my reviving spirits these mythological notions seemed to come unbidden. As for my uncle, he was beginning to storm against the horizontal road. He loved nothing better than a vertical path, but this way seemed indefinitely prolonged. Instead of sliding along the hypotenuse as we were now doing, he would willingly have dropped down the terrestrial radius. But there was no help for it, and as long as we were approaching the centre at all, we felt that we must not complain. From time to time a steeper path appeared. Our naiad then began to tumble before us with a hoarser murmur, and we went down with her to a greater depth. On the whole, that day and the next we made considerable way horizontally, very little vertically. On Friday evening, the 10th of July, according to our calculations, we were thirty leagues southeast of Reykjavik, and at a depth of two leagues and a half. At our feet there now opened a frightful abyss. My uncle, however, was not to be daunted, and he clapped his hands at the steepness of the descent. "'This will take us a long way,' he cried, "'and without much difficulty, for the projections in the rock form quite a staircase.' The ropes were so fastened by hands as to guard against accident, and the descent commenced. I can hardly call it perilous, for I was beginning to be familiar with this kind of exercise. This well, or abyss, was a narrow cleft in the mass of the granite, called by geologists a fault, and caused by the unequal cooling of the globe of the earth. If it had at one time been a passage for the eruptive matter thrown out by Snaefell, I still could not understand why no trace was left of its passage. We kept going down a kind of winding staircase, which seemed almost to have been made by the hand of man. Every quarter of an hour we were obliged to halt to take a little necessary repose and restore the action of our limbs. We then sat down upon a fragment of rock, and we talked as we ate and drank from the stream. Of course, down this fault the Hansbach fell into a cascade, and lost some of its volume, but there was enough and to spare to slake our thirst. Besides, when the incline became more gentle, it would of course resume its peaceable course. At this moment it reminded me of my worthy uncle, in his frequent fits of impatience and anger, while below it ran with the calmness of the Icelandic hunter. On the 6th and 7th of July we kept following the spiral curves of this singular well, penetrating in actual distance no more than two leagues, but being carried to a depth of five leagues below the level of the sea. But on the 8th, about noon, the fault took towards the south-east a much gentler slope, one of about forty-five degrees. Then the road became monotonously easy. It could not be otherwise, for there was no landscape to vary the stages of our journey. On Wednesday, the 15th, we were seven leagues underground, and had travelled fifty leagues away from Snaefell. Although we were tired, our health was perfect, and the medicine chest had not yet had occasion to be opened. My uncle noted every hour the indications of the compass, and the chronometer, the aneroid, and the thermometer, the very same which he had published in his scientific report of our journey. 
It was therefore not difficult to know exactly our whereabouts. When he told me that we had gone fifty leagues horizontally, I could not repress an exclamation of astonishment at the thought that we had now long left Iceland behind. "'What is the matter?' he cried. "'I was reflecting that, if your calculations are correct, then we are no longer under Iceland. "'Do you think so?' "'I am not mistaken,' I said, and examining the map, I added, "'We have passed Cape Portland, and those fifty leagues bring us under the wide expanse of ocean.' "'Under the sea?' my uncle repeated, rubbing his hands with delight. "'Can it be?' I said. "'Is the ocean spread above our heads?' "'Of course, Axel. What can be more natural?' At Newcastle are there not coal-mines extending far under the sea? It was all very well for the professor to call this so simple, but I could not feel quite easy at the thought that the boundless ocean was rolling over my head. And yet it really mattered very little whether it was the plains and mountains that covered our heads, or the Atlantic waves, so long as we were arched over by solid granite. And besides, I was getting used to this idea, for the tunnel, now running straight, now winding as capriciously in its inclines as in its turnings, but constantly preserving its south-easterly direction, and always running deeper, was gradually carrying us to very great depths indeed. Four days later, Saturday the 18th of July, in the evening, we arrived at a kind of vast grotto, and here my uncle paid Hans his weekly wages, and it was settled that the next day, Sunday, should be a day of rest. End of chapter 24 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to see how you can help this project, please see LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne Chapter 25 De Profundis I therefore awoke next day, relieved from the preoccupation of an immediate start. Although we were in the very deepest of known depths, there was something not unpleasant about it. And besides, we were beginning to get accustomed to this troglodyte life. I no longer thought of sun, moon, and stars, trees, houses, and towns, nor any of those terrestrial superfluities which are necessities of men who live upon the earth's surface. Being fossils, we looked upon all those things as mere jokes. The grotto was an immense apartment. Along its granite floor ran our faithful stream. At this distance from its spring the water was scarcely tepid, and we drank of it with pleasure. After breakfast the professor gave a few hours to the arrangement of his daily notes. First, said he, I will make a calculation to ascertain our exact position. I hope after our return to draw a map of our journey, which will be in reality a vertical section of the globe, containing the track of our expedition. That will be curious, uncle, but are your observations sufficiently accurate to enable you to do this correctly? Yes. I have everywhere observed the angles and the inclines. I am sure there is no error. Let us see now where we are. Take your compass and note the direction. I looked and replied carefully, southeast by east. Well, answered the professor after a rapid calculation, I infer that we have gone eighty-five leagues since we started therefore we are under mid-Atlantic. To be sure we are. And perhaps at this very moment there is a storm above, and ships above our heads are being rudely tossed by the tempest. Quite probable. And whales are lashing the roof of our prison with their tails. It may be, Axel, but they won't shake us here. But let us go back to our calculation. Here we are eighty-five leagues southeast of Snaefell, and I reckon that we are a depth of sixteen leagues. Sixteen leagues, I cried. No doubt. Why, this is the very limit assigned by science to the thickness of the crust of the earth. I don't deny it. And here, according to the law of increasing temperature, there ought to be a heat of 2,732 degrees Fahrenheit. So there should, my lad. And all this solid granite ought to be running in fusion. You see, that is not so. And that, as so often happens, facts come to overthrow theories. I am obliged to agree. But after all, it is surprising. What does the thermometer say? Twenty-seven and six-tenths, or eighty-two degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore the savants are wrong by two thousand seven hundred and five degrees, and the proportional increase is a mistake. 
Therefore, Humphrey Davy was right, and I am not wrong in following him. What do you say now? Nothing. In truth, I had a good deal to say. I gave way in no respect to Davy's theory. I still held to the central heat, although I did not feel its effects. I preferred to admit in truth that this chimney of an extinct volcano, lined with lavas, which are non-conductors of heat, did not suffer the heat to pass through its walls. But without stopping to look up new arguments, I simply took up our situation such as it was. Well, admitting all your calculations to be quite correct, you must allow me to draw one rigid result therefrom. What is it? Speak freely. At the latitude of Iceland, where we are now, the radius of the earth, the distance from the centre to the surface, is about 1,583 leagues, let us say in round numbers 1,600 leagues, or 4,800 miles. Out of 1,600 leagues, we have gone 12. So you say. And these 12 at a cost of 85 leagues diagonally. Exactly so. In 20 days. Yes. Now, 16 leagues are the hundredth part of the Earth's radius. At this rate, we shall be 2,000 days, or nearly five years and a half, in getting to the centre. No answer was vouchsafed to this rational conclusion. Without reckoning, too, that if a vertical depth of 16 leagues can be attained only by a diagonal descent of 85, it follows that we must go 8,000 miles in a southeasterly direction. We shall emerge from some point in the Earth's circumference, instead of getting to the centre. "'Confusion to all your figures and your hypotheses besides!' shouted my uncle in a sudden rage. "'What is the basis of them all? How do you know that this passage does not run straight to our destination? Besides, there is a precedent. What one man has done, another man may do.' "'I hope so, but still I may be permitted. You shall have my leave to hold your tongue, Axel, but not to talk in that irrational way.' I could see the awful professor bursting through my uncle's skin, and I took timely warning. Now look at your aneroid. What does that say? It says we are under considerable pressure. Very good. So you see that by going gradually down and getting accustomed to the density of the atmosphere, we don't suffer at all. Nothing except a little pain in my ears. That's nothing, and you may get rid of even that by quick breathing whenever you feel the pain. Exactly so, I said, determined not to say a word that might cross my uncle's prejudices. There is even positive pleasure in living in this dense atmosphere. Have you observed how intense sound is down here? No doubt it is. A deaf man would soon learn to hear perfectly. But won't this density augment? Yes, according to a rather obscure law. It is well known that the weight of bodies diminishes as fast as we descend. You know that it is at the surface of the globe that weight is most sensibly felt, and that at the centre there is no weight at all. I am aware of that, but tell me, will not the air at least acquire the density of water? Of course, under a pressure of 710 atmospheres. And how, lower still? Lower down, the density will still increase. But how shall we go down then? Why, we must fill our pockets with stones. Well, indeed, my worthy uncle, you are never at a loss for an answer. I dared venture no farther into the region of probabilities, for I might presently have stumbled upon an impossibility, which would have brought the professor on the scene when he was not wanted. Still, it was evident that the air, under a pressure which might reach that of thousands of atmospheres, would at last reach the solid state, and then, even if our bodies could resist the strain, we should be stopped, and no reasonings would be able to get us on any further. But I did not advance this argument. My uncle would have met it with his inevitable sac nusem, a precedent which possessed no weight with me. For even if the journey of the learned Icelander were really attested, there was one very simple answer, that in the sixteenth century there was neither barometer nor aneroid, and therefore Sacknesem could not tell how far he had gone. But I kept this objection to myself, and waited the course of events. The rest of the day was passed in calculations and in conversations. I remained a steadfast adherent of the opinions of Professor Liedenbock, and I envied the stolid indifference of Hans, who, without going into causes and effects, went on with his eyes shut, wherever his destiny guided him. End of chapter 25 Recorded in Nottingham, England, on the 16th of January, 2006 by Alex Foster www.alexfoster.me.uk